Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini podcast features informal, on topic discussions with in house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting edge and practical white collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCooey.com for more information on our nationally ranked white collar and investigations practice. On this episode of White Collar Briefly, Perkins Coie partner Barack Cohen, a former corruption prosecutor who has both conducted government investigations in the financial services industry and represented clients in the industry, speaks with Ben Purser, chief risk officer for mortgage consumer lender Round Point Mortgage Servicing Corporation, about risk management and legal compliance in an industry directly affected by not just one, but two global financial crises in 10 years. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Cooey LLP and should not be considered legal advice. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of the White Collar Briefly podcast series. I'm going to be your host, Brock Cohen, and our guest today is Ben Purser, Chief Risk Officer for Round Point Mortgage, and we're going to be discussing the challenges of consumer lending during a pandemic. Just to offer some facts by way of an introduction to the podcast, I think as everybody knows, in January 2020, it was acknowledged that the COVID-19 pandemic had hit the United States. Uh, And the first confirmed case of local transmission was recorded that month. And in fact, the first known deaths happened in February. By the end of March, there were cases in all 50 U.S. states and the District of Columbia. And by June 24th, 2020, the U.S. had the most confirmed active cases and deaths in the world. And by June 26th, the death rate was 379 per million people, the seventh highest rate globally. So the effect on the U.S. economy and uh, the consumers who make up that economy has been obvious. It's been devastating, to say the least. Aside from the sheer burden on the healthcare system, there's been a stock market crash. There's fear of a looming depression. We're already in a recession. And the, the economy contracted 4.8% from January through March 2020, and the unemployment rate has risen to a peak of 14.7%. That was in April. And we expect that the healthcare cost could be anywhere from $34 billion to $251 billion, according to some analysts. Having provided that information, let me introduce you to our guest, Ben Purser. Ben has had 34 years in the financial services industry, 27 of those years in governance roles, including serving as the chief audit executive in two public companies and the chief compliance officer in the Troubled Asset Release Program, the TARP program, um, that has some similarities to the current situation that we'll get to later in the podcast. Most recently, Ben has been the chief risk officer at two different mortgage companies, including his current role at Round Point Mortgage Servicing Corporation. He's a proud native of North Carolina and a Duke graduate. Ben, welcome. Hey, Barack. Thank you very much for having me. I do appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, I think a good place to start here would be to provide some background regarding your industry and then then use that as a way to explain what you do. Although uh, you and I have spoken quite a bit, and I've done stuff in the industry. I've worked in the industry. I'm always surprised by the new information I learn when when people actually explain the, the granular details of their everyday job. So what, what does the industry do? What is, what's the financial services industry about? Primarily providing liquidity and services to, to homes. If you think about it, whether it is a car loan or even insurance, if you, if you want to go there from renters to homeowners and loans for various and sundry things in and around where we live and work. And so so if you look at it really broadly, financial services is about supplying that ability to have the things that we need to continue life and also the things that we need to enjoy life. And whether that be through debt or simple transactional services, you know, it's, it's really a, an integral part of, uh, of our daily lives. And then in my case in particular at Round Point, obviously we're focused on home lending and and servicing of of mortgages for people who are you know buying their homes and we have about 400,000 loans so we're a mid-sized non-bank servicer probably in the top 20 and we do originate loans as well primarily for borrowers that we already service loans for who want a lower rate or or what have you or have other needs a cash out refi or whatever 
So we, we both originate and service loans. The majority of our loans pre-COVID were generally current. And, you know, while we do offer loss mitigation services, for instance, to borrowers who, who do have financial difficulties, for the most part, round points borrowers tend to be relatively current. And most of our loans are either owned by Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or insured or guaranteed by one of the housing agencies in the, in the U.S. government. Ben, before we move on, I do want to say one thing, and that's to confirm Ben is speaking to us on, on his own behalf here. He, his, the views he, he represents, the opinions he provides are not those of Round Point. They're his own, for better or worse. No, and I would have gotten to that eventually because my lawyers would beat me up if I did not. <laughs> <laughs> when you were explaining what Round Point does, there's a lot, uh, clearly a lot of activity that goes on. What sort of risks are you looking at, and what are your direct obligations to the company when you're when you're analyzing those risks? Yeah, and so for me, and I would say that for the title of chief risk officer, which may or may not include compliance or even legal activities, the the uh, specific duties will vary by organization. But but for me, I am responsible for all of our risk management and compliance activities at Roundpoint. And so really what that means is making sure that the company understands technological, operational, financial compliance and other risks that we're running and that we have built a process for whatever risk we want to talk about that operates the firm inside of the guidance we have set for ourselves and or has been set for us by our friends, the regulators. Um, and there are the good news is there are only about 10,000 different rules that a mortgage company has to follow. Good news um, for lawyers actually, anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not exaggerating. If you add up all the state and federal regulations, as well as Fannie and Freddie have a number of servicing rules and originations rules, as do the housing agencies. And so my job is to make sure that when we build a process, it's going to keep us inside of whatever rules apply or if we're looking at operational financial risk, whatever parameters the company has decided are acceptable. And then I also test those processes to make sure that we're actually within those tolerances. And then I also tend to advise on tactical or strategic things that the company uh, is doing or wants to do. So there, are, so there are two things that really interest me in what you just said. One is just the, the sheer scope of the kind of advice you give that ultimately has to be something that actually eats up profits to a certain extent. And then the second thing that interests me is this idea of testing the process. Let's talk, you know, let, let's get to the first issue for, uh, before we get to the testing. The testing is something inter- particularly interesting. So look, it's just obvious based on the scope of your job that some of what you're describing, some of the policy, some of the policies that I'm sure you have to weigh in on are going to cut against Profits to some extent, near-term profits. How do you sell your company? I'm not, I'm not talking specifically about Roundpoint here because you have plenty of experience in, in the industry and you've dealt with a bunch of companies. But how do you how do you get your management to buy into something that's going to cost them profit, short-term profit? Yeah, it's always a fun topic, and and actually we could have an entire podcast on this one issue alone. But I think the important thing from my perspective is it all depends on the view you want to take. And it's important to align yourself if you're in a governance role. Because as you know, Barack, I mean, regulators are increasingly coming to visit and and bring actions against not just companies, but individuals within those companies. And, And so it's important if you're in a governance role to align yourself with people that have that same view as you. And so our CEO likes to talk about building a generational company which speaks to a long-term view rather than you know, trying to make quick hits off bubbles. And so if you take that long-term view and you align yourself with people who do, it becomes a little bit easier, but you're still in that conversation every day. It's, it's what's the cost benefit and what sort of risk do you feel comfortable running as a residual to whatever control processes we put in place. And, and yeah, the scope is kind of extreme. Everything from human resources issues to RESPA compliance. And so having the ability to communicate the specific risks and the potential impacts of those to people with whom you share a, a view, a mindset and a, and a vision term, if you will, I personally think is critical. 
And, and look, you don't always get your way if, as a as a governance professional, and I would argue it's not the job of a chief risk officer to always get his or her way. It's the the job is to raise your hand and say, "Hey, do you know what you're doing here?" And helping people make sure they know how to control what they're doing. So testing, how do you how do you test this process? Are you talking about stress tests? And to some extent, yes. And we actually have a variety of ways that we test ourselves. So we have about 350 individual daily, weekly, or monthly metrics that we monitor on a very regular basis. And those some of those are production-oriented, some of them are compliance-oriented, and some of them are policy-oriented. And we have uh, an online dashboard that allows not only myself, but everyone in the company to look at how we're doing in terms of, let's say, speed of answering the phone. How long are our borrowers on hold? How, how often do they hang up because they're frustrated? So we manage that really as, as what is known as the first line of defense. The business units are responsible for managing those metrics, and I use them to evaluate performance. We also have a quality assurance function built into every business unit that we have that, that again, measures process. It measures success. It offers feedback. So, for instance, in, say, a loss mitigation where we offer borrowers modifications, the QA department makes sure that the modification was structured correctly to the terms of whoever owns the loan. So if it's a Fannie Mae loan, we got to make sure we're meeting their requirements. And that happens before the documents go out the door to the borrower, before we report it to Fannie. Um, And then I also have both quality control testing, which does statistical sampling across all of our mortgage activities, be it originations or servicing. To put it in perspective, there are about 18 different aspects of servicing that we do statistical sampling against every month and do testing and produce results that businesses have to respond to. And that's also true on the origination side of the house. Just a few fewer, call it columns or categories of testing. And then also we have an independent audit department that reports through me actually to the board of directors. And they do testing not only of the call center and their metrics and their QA process. They also test my processes in quality control and and our other control activities. So uh, we have a tremendous amount of basically feedback mechanisms that operate in different ways and and come at the same issue from from different angles, if you will, to, to be able to not only validate that it's working the way we think it should, the way we designed it, but that, hey, that's the best way for it to work. So what are the systemic incentives for management to to pay attention to things when you flag them? Again, it gets back to how you want to look at your, your view, if you will. So, you know, as you know, from my background, I've, I've worked in a couple of places that were going through interesting regulatory times and and others that have been a little more placid if you will in that regard and and so you know if you if you look at it in terms of what do you want the future of the company to be and design and from my perspective that's sort of how I how I communicate things is yes we can take this action here and it will benefit us in the near term and in the longer term we're going to have a lot of questions on exams and potential issues to deal with or being directed to refund uh, or things like that. So, you know, with my management team, the the incentive is, again, we're trying to build a company that is generational in nature, not something to exist for a while to get rich on and then sell it to somebody else. So, so we have that incentive and, and it works when, when you, when you focus on doing things the right way over the long term. You know, our regulatory fines and penalties, I don't mind saying, and, and Roundpoint wouldn't mind me saying, is under five figures for the last five years. Um, you know, compare that with some of the settlements that you've seen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right. in your career, I'm sure you see much larger dollar amounts back and forth, right? Definitely have. I know from our prior conversations that the current economic situation's effect on consumers is definitely something you're you're aware of. A lot of our conversation has been about profit in the company. How, how does that sensitivity to consumers play into your role as chief risk officer? Well, it always does. So sort of every day we're looking at the concept of 
just compliance with the consumer financial laws in the first instance, because, you know, you, you certainly have to. But beyond that, we look at it as a good idea because to the extent that uh, we treat borrowers the right way, whether it be because of a rule or because it's the right thing to do, it'll benefit us in the long run. And and then when you filter in something like the current environment, there become a great number of additional sort of permutations that you have to think about. And some of those are literally just the the impact on the economy today. And, and I know you know you and I've talked about it before, and we'll talk more later in this in this discussion about the 2008 recession and sort of similarities or contrasts. But the biggest contrast, I think, is that this situation that we're in today is affecting every single segment of the world, you know, not to mention just American economy, right? So there, there isn't a segment that you have to worry about. It's, it's really everybody. I know there are a lot of metrics you lo- you've described that fall within your ambit as chief risk officer. Is there something... Is there something broader about the metrics you have to look look at here in the pandemic, or, or is it the same thing you would have looked at in 2008? Look, a lot of it is the same. There's some differences, though. And, and today, obviously, you know, something like the CARES Act is a very different piece of legislation than the legislation that enabled TARP. You know, it, it was very specific in, in the case of impacts to my business, very specific about what mortgage companies had to do. And so, You know, the first question is, oh my gosh, can we spin this up fast enough? You know, can we get to the point where we can actually help borrowers and sort of give them the the help that they need? But there's some other things that we thought about too that are less sort of obvious. There are requirements to send payment reminder notices before someone reaches the end of their grace period to pay their mortgage without a late fee. Um, And if you've just put someone on a forbearance because they have just lost their job, because we're going through the worst economic situation, you know, since the Great Depression, you don't want to be sending them that reminder, right? Uh, It's just, it's not only useless, but it's also upsetting to them. There's nothing in the CARES Act that says I don't have to send that piece of paper. There are 12 states that want me to send it. We decided not to send it. And, And that's a risk you end up taking. I'll defend that every day, by the way, for the next two to three years. But it's a, it's a risk that we're happy to take. Because it doesn't make any sense to sort of tell the borrower, yep, you're on a forbearance, you don't have to make any payments, and then uh, two days later tell them, hey, you missed your payment. Doesn't doesn't that, you know. That, actually, I, I find that interesting. So what essentially you're explicitly, you, you're not following a specific regulatory guideline, right? And what interests me about that is, and this is different from 2008 or from other kind of compliance prosecution enforcement context I've seen is that federal agencies at least seem to be somewhat more permissive because of the severity of the pandemic. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that too. And I can be very even more specific here. I've seen, you know, not that I want to, not not that it's my job to say great things about regulators or prosecutors, but I've noticed (laughs) that the CFP, quite to the contrary, I've noticed that uh, the CFPB appears to be telling companies like Round Point and others, that, yeah, we're going to, certain things we're, we're not going to be as strict about right now just because of the, just because of the pandemic and the situation and the, and the crisis. We're not going to worry as much, as much as we normally would about certain requirements. I mean, have you, are you yeah, seeing that? No, that's exactly right. And, and, I, and I've been shocked by that, to be honest. Now, bluntly, we have not seen quite as much of that from our friends in the States. But for instance, one of the things that you're supposed to do when you, a forbearance plan is supposed to be a real short term solution. And typically they'll run 90 to maybe 120 days. And under the CFPB rules, when, when you set someone up on a forbearance plan, you're supposed to send them a notice that says, Hey, we gave you a short term solution based on incomplete information. Here's a full application for loss mitigation. Fill it out, get it back to us and, and, and we'll evaluate you for all possible options. And that's, you know, a hard and fast requirement. It's called the incomplete notice and you you have to send it. And we actually made the determination we were not going to be sending it based on some some conversations I had with some contacts at the CFPB because they told us that they were going to be issuing this guidance that offered leniency. So, you know, we actually built that concept into the documentation we send to borrowers that describes the forbearance plan. 
that, hey, you know, when, when this ends, you need to come back to us and, and we can help you more potentially if you give us more info. But I was very surprised that CFPB has been that flexible. Again, we're not seeing that from the states and frankly, not seeing it from the GSEs or even FHFA, um, you know, in terms of some of the things they're still requiring us to do. But it's definitely a very different scenario than in 2008. And actually, that, so that brings up two points I'm kind of, I'm, I'm interested in. So the first is your comment that you're not seeing that same kind of flexibility from state enforcers and regulators. And I, you know, that, that strikes me as really consistent with the way the states normally function vis-a-vis the Fed. So if the Fed leaves a vacuum and doesn't act, if federal agencies don't, don't do, don't enforce or decide not to regulate in an area, then the states, state, state AGs will step in and aggressively do what, what they think is appropriate. That's um, right. Whether, whether it makes sense or not. That, that seems, that seems to be the case always. But I'm curious, especially given your experience in the TARP in, in, in the 2008 period, were, what, were, what were you seeing the states do then? I mean, the SIG TARP was pretty aggressive. We, we talked about this too. Um, and, and you know that I've, I've, I've had dealings in a positive. <laughs> Neil Borofsky, the former Sig Tarp, of course, is now on the defense side, as I am. And I actually did when I was at DOJ. I did some Tarp prosecution work. We, we worked with them on some matters. And I've on the defense side, I've also interacted with Neil. And I I, I know the Sig Tarp is a pretty effective, pretty effective organization, and and still still brings some big cases. What were the states doing then? Well, to be honest, not anywhere near as much as they're doing today. And I think, you know, the, the, the way that states have matured or enhanced their examination process since then ha- has been astronomical almost. It used to be that a, a state exam of a mortgage company was little more than a file review. And now they're asking questions about governance and, and risk metrics and, AML programs and information security, and it's much, much broader. And, and I agree with your point completely. The states have definitely, in the last two and a half years, even even more so, sort of stepped up their aggressiveness in terms of their enforcement and their exams and their oversight. So now, you know, we, we have literally every state is issuing guidance that requires us or, and here's where and Brock, I'm, I'm curious about your opinion on this one too, but um, it's one thing for a state to tell me I have to do something and then I just do it. But I've got two conundrums for you. One, you know, what do I do when I'm, I'm just going to pick a random example of a state just for fun. Say the New York DFS tells me that they would recommend that I not charge late fees during the crisis. And, and, and then sort of parallel to that, when the AG of New York, who doesn't technically regulate me, sends me a letter asking me what I'm doing and giving giving me their expectations, uh, okay, <laughs> especially if those expectations are different than, say, the CARES Act, you know. So, what do I do now? <laughs> and that that's where I would love to get your input on states that recommend, and then an AG that asks me to do something in contravention to or not quite in, in, in line with, say, the CARES Act. Yeah. I, so in a situation like that, what I normally do is I try to assess all the data points. So I look at what the state's asking for. I look to the history of enforcement by that state. I look to any rhetoric, any any official rhetoric uh, or unofficial information I can find about what the state's the state says it's going to do versus what it's actually doing. So if I have contacts at the at the appropriate state entity, I might con- I might talk to them, or if I know people who who have contacts, I might ask them, "Hey, we're hearing this. What's really happening?" So we, I generally I will look at all those data points and I will triangulate. And somewhere in the middle of that triangulation is do it because it's easy to do and you might get in trouble, or yeah, it'd be great if you did this, but it's really burdensome. You can probably ignore it because they're not enforcing and they don't really mean what their their recommendation is. Really, nothing more than a recommendation. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, certain entity, certain states and certain entities are just crazy and completely erratic. And I'll point that out. And you know, most of them are pretty crazy and erratic, but I'll, I'll, some of them especially so. And I'll, I'll point that out and 
you know, hey, it'd be a good idea to listen because the risks here are especially high and they're very unpredictable. Um, right. And when you, I mean, uh, you're right to point out the problem of a state AG that's directing you to do something that's contrary to the CARES Act. And again, it's, it's all about the data points. What is the AG advising? Which particular provision of the CARES Act does it go to? And ultimately, what's the risk of enforcement? What's the burden? What's the burden of trying to comply one way or the other? So right. it becomes, you know, it becomes a business decision and a subjective analysis with respect to the likelihood of enforcement. Got it. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And that's kind of how we've approached it. There have been a number of AGs that have sent out industry letters. And then, as I've noted, all the states have issued various and sundry types of regulations that, you know, they just, again, they weren't doing this type of thing to anywhere near this degree back in 2008. And I I think the fact that they are today is a reaction to to the fact that we didn't have the consumer protections pre-2008 that we do today. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and again, I was part of TARP. I helped design some of those housing programs that we put in place. So I'm, I'm a fan of additional oversight and, and also operational discipline in the mortgage industry, which bluntly it is not famous for. So I was going to say, I've, I've seen some of that lack of discipline. And I've seen the kind of enforcement it, it invites. So I'm sorry, you, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to, you know, back in, in it was probably 09, one of my very clear memories, although a, a minor issue in, in my days in TARP was a servicer literally telling me, and I still remember the exact quote, Ben, you will get no factually accurate information from us today. Um, because they <laughs> literally, yeah, yeah, exactly. They literally couldn't uh, produce data that showed me what they had done because they, they didn't have control of their data. Uh, and I won't name names, but this was not a small company. And, and so today, I think that is much different and Certainly at Roundpoint and other mortgage companies I've been associated with, we have, we have a much better control of operations and a much better control of our information than we had before, which frankly has set us up well to respond to what we're going through right now. Sure. So, I mean, as a, as a guy that does internal investigations and compliance advice, I appreciate it when companies, when companies have a command of, of the information we need to defend ourselves against regulators or enforcers and show them that we've done nothing wrong or that something inadvertent may have happened, but we're on top of it. But at the same time, I, having seen enough enforcement, when you're hit with this patchwork of requirements, it becomes really burdensome. And you, I mean, you've already alluded to it. How do you, how do you disentangle all these, all these enforcement entities and figure out who you have to listen to when they contradict each other? And you're, you're working hard to keep up and you're trying to, you're trying to stay on top of the data. And in the end, you know, one of them is going to catch you. Right. And look, it's going to happen. And so what we've done, and I think most companies have, but so I'm not saying we're special, but nonetheless, we have a pretty disciplined change management process. And it, it, the way Roundpoint works, very senior people are involved in that process from the chief operating officer and me. Uh, to, to department heads, not just people doing the work. And so if we were to meet once a week with, say, my call center before COVID, we're now meeting daily with the call center. <laughs> and you can't do it any other way because there's so much coming at you all at once. And and then there are things that we, we have to do, but there are also things that we're trying to do that just going to make everyone's life better. So like Everyone else in the industry, right after the passage of the CARES Act, we were inundated with calls. We ran full day Saturday and Sunday call center shifts. And we also very quickly, and, and, and this is another risk decision you get to make in times like this, with relatively limited testing, we spun up a self-help tool on our website so borrowers don't have to talk to us to get a forbearance. Yeah. And then, so one of the things I track <laughs> is, are we actually setting those up that came through that tool correctly? That's one of the, the new reports that we get daily to make sure that that tool is working the way we think it should. But, but the real key for us has been twofold, Brock. One is, again, senior people around the table every day or multiple times a day to go through all of the just, just deluge of, of uh, new requirements that we're getting or New recommendations. <laughs> and, and again, who is making the recommendation? And, and this is where I'll give you, you and your profession 
kudos. Having good lawyers, both internally and externally, I have found to be very valuable over my career. And, and we make strong use of them because if, if or nothing else, to your earlier point, you know, you've got contacts at New York, you've got contacts in Massachusetts or what have you, or California, other states that that are known to be aggressive enforcers, shall we say. And you can help us navigate those gray areas that might end up coming back to us later. You know, so that's that's really the approach we've taken is just all hands on deck. Pretty much every day we are sorting through this stuff and then sorting through the operational necessities to make it happen. And actually, that to, to, to me, what that evokes is just the sheer difficulty. I mean, it's part of the interesting thing about enforcement generally especially when you're talking about industry like yours is that it necessarily relies on a lot of data when the CFPB try, opens an investigation and tries to bring a case it looks at a lot of information and even before the investigation gets open when we're still talking about you know a company just going about its its course of business you're collecting a lot of data you're trying to disentangle a lot of data you're trying to track a lot of data and all of that is being analyzed against conflicting, sometimes conflicting guidance, a ton, what did you say, 10,000 different regulations yeah. that, that are relevant? Or and, rules. <laughs> or rules. And what I've seen time and time again defending companies is that when something has happened, when a company has done something wrong, it often happens because the company just didn't realize that there was anything going wrong. There was too much. In it. There was there was such a sheer mass of information that the company didn't know how to disentangle the, the bad strand that it should have paid attention to. And of course, the That's enforcers right. only see the bad strand. They don't understand. They don't really look to the rest of it. You're you're right, Brock. And that's one of the things that you know. A piece of advice I would give to anyone is you can do the right thing all day long, but if you can't prove it later, it didn't happen. And whether it is a matter of producing the data or producing the other evidence that you need to have, you you've got to have control of your information. And uh, amusingly, it was about the second question I asked when I was interviewing at Roundpoint. Again, having worked in some places where data was hard to come by, and having Having seen, and not just in servicing when I was at TARP, you know, we, we dealt with companies in all aspects of, of the financial services arena, you know, just having seen so many examples of people who, who couldn't disentangle the mess. Uh, it was a high priority to me to make sure that the next place I, I went was either already there <laughs> or working assiduously to get there. So let's, let's switch gears slightly. You talked about the TARP and we've talked a bit about how the 2008 crisis has affected things. Specifically, you said the states. I've developed a better command of the kind of data that plays into your industry. What other comparisons or differences do you see between the 2008 crisis and the current crisis in terms of your job? You know, this has always been good advice, but for me, it became crystal clear in 2008 and, and, and afterwards for me. One of which is You've got to engage with your regulators, whether it be at a state level or at the federal level. You know, a month does not go by that I'm not on my own initiative interacting with a regulator. And, and we, uh, we saw that in TARP. We were not a regulator per se, but we were a, a government entity that people had to listen to. And the successful companies were the ones that were engaging with us. And, and so that's one of the things I took away from it was, that you, you you really absolutely have to have those relationships that you can pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm going to intentionally do X because of this, you know, unprecedented time we're living through. You're good with that, right? And if you don't do that and 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 you don't discuss your issues or problems with them, then they're going to find it two years later in an exam and, and then it's going to be a, a, a bone of contention. Well, you, you're describing a very specific kind of relationship with regulators, but you can't do that with prosecutors. Um, no. So if you're dealing with I DOJ. I do not call AGs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you really can't do that with prosecutors. There are places in DOJ that will entertain questions and then provide some kind of limited guidance. They'll never say it's okay. They'll just they'll essentially say, based on the facts, we, we, we probably would not pay attention to that. But even that's not uniform. So dealing with regulators is one thing, but if you if you're at a point where you're actually dealing with prosecutors and SIGTARP, I mean they're prosecutors, they're bringing they're yeah. bringing criminal cases, um, right? There are limitations dealing with entities like that. 
Oh, absolutely. And and there I would not make the phone call. I would have you make that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, if, <laughs> if, if there were a situation that I thought might, you know, end up in that arena, that's not one where I engage. You know, that's why I, I'm not kidding. I would call you and say, help. You know, and I imagine you get those calls a lot, actually. That is all I do. <laughs> well, has there been an uptick pre, you know, since COVID or is it too early for that yet? No, we're starting to see an uptick in COVID-19 related allegations. Well, DOJ turned to those kinds of issues pretty fast, but I think they were, they were bringing cases against low hanging fruit. White collar cases are, are actually very burdensome for the federal government to take bringing from a prosecutor's perspective, putting together a strong white collar case takes years of investigate of careful investigation and looking at paper trails. That's part of what makes them so burdensome. Now I can say this because I'm the defense side. It's what makes them so burdensome. The requests for information that can be excruciating and then really expensive for companies. So it's very hard to say how seriously DOJ and these various entities will go in prosecuting cases. They appear to be serious, but it may just be I mean, given given the slight uptick and slight interest we're seeing on the things I, and the things I read about. But it's really hard to say long term what that means. And talking about the CARES Act and the the analog, the current analog to SIGTARP, which essentially functions the same way. It's organized the same way. There's a special IG for for pandemic related investigations. There's a congressional oversight panel. There's a panel made up of various other AGs. It's very, very similar. It was almost taken verbatim from, from the TARP, from the SIG TARP legislation. You know, the, a, a clear problem that the pandemic prosecutors are going to have is that there are already some stumbling blocks that have been raised by the administration with respect to transparency. So it makes it more difficult to go after big businesses. And I think they're still arguing through some of these points at the legislative level. But it, it's just not clear that there is going to be a commitment to go after big companies. And, and that, of course, ultimately drives the severity of the prosecutions. So the short answer is we are seeing some uptick. A lot of the other kind of investigative activity I've always seen in other areas continues to be pretty serious. So like the healthcare industry, for example, I still see plenty of investigations relating to the healthcare industry. I would expect a lot more healthcare investigations relating to pandemic issues, not necessarily because of a commitment by prosecutors to go after pandemic related issues, but because the pandemic and the pandemic necessarily creates the opportunity for healthcare fraud and all kinds of healthcare related activity that sometimes draws, naturally draws attention from from DOJ and HHS and other organizations. Yeah, and I think there were some extra incentives for certain treatments for COVID mm -hmm. in Medicare and Medicaid, if, if memory serves, in the CARES Act. So, yep. you know, that, that could theoretically be a place where folks might look to see if, if there had been some inappropriate behaviors. I, I don't know the scope of those, though, because, again, they don't affect me directly. But I, I get the sense that... At least in the near term, the, the kinds of misconduct or alleged misconduct they're looking at is pretty small scale, which, which, you know, is natural. It takes a while for the government to put together cases, but it's just hard to tell how serious or committed they are to bringing cases. I will say that companies are very serious, and maybe this follows the 2008 situation. Companies are very serious about getting compliance advice. So I get a lot of calls about compliance advice, and my colleagues at the law firm get questions to uh, everything from Questions about the PPP to kickback issues involving investments in COVID-19 related healthcare entities or, or, or questions from your industry relating to CFPB and what it might or might not do based on, on things that you, you have planned. And we're seeing some investigations too. Some, some, it's just, I guess thinking about it, we are seeing a few bigger ones, but at the, primarily at the state level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's what we're seeing. I'm, su I'm surprised there's much this early, but as you, uh, to your point, it takes a while to build those cases. But well, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the attorney general's head. Um, <laughs> but but if, another podcast. That's a whole different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's the next podcast. But I suppose if you're trying to make a preemptive point to deter misconduct, you go after their low hanging fruit really quickly, which maybe, which is probably what we saw. But it's the follow through from a, from, from a prosecutor 
perspective. It's the follow through that probably counts more. Right. Um, and on the defense side, I just don't need it. A lot of the work is still, it's, it's really still too early to tell for sure, even though we are seeing some work. So to wrap things up, let's, let's get out into brass tacks here. As a risk officer, what's your advice for listeners out there who are interested in the kinds of issues you deal with every day? Find a different career path. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> it, it's actually a fascinating career path. And one of the, one of the th- great things about it, you've already mentioned the, the breadth of what I get to deal with on a day to day basis completely eliminates the possibility of boredom for most days. And, and, you know, so by the way, I'm going to flip this question back at you in terms of advice you're giving people in in the current environment. But, you know, the first thing in terms of, you know, advice I would give the folks, especially in in crisis moments, is that you've got to have the right people around the table as you're sorting through this stuff. There's a great book, The Wisdom of Crowds, which you know is fairly well known. I live by it because a, a well-conducted or well-constructed group will almost always make a better decision than the smartest person in the group, especially if I'm the smartest person in the group. You know, so you got to have the right people around the table, and that's not just your execs, but it's the people who are actually doing the work too. And everybody's got to have sort of the freedom to speak. And if you don't do it that way, you're you're filtering stuff top down which is bad enough or much worse, you know, you're letting it just happen at the bottom level and you're not understanding what's going on. And there I will guarantee if you do that, you'll, you'll need the Barack Cohen's of the world in your corner very quickly. You know, for us in in my industry and any consumer finance industry, I think you, you have to default, if you will, towards helping or not inconveniencing the consumer one way or the other. So again, for us, the, the, the CARES Act requirements are, for us are straightforward. Give people forbearances. There are a few things that we have to do to tick some boxes for Freddie or Fannie or HUD when we're, when we're interacting with the borrowers. But if you've got a federally backed mortgage loan, you know, we should be making it in our industry as easy as possible for people to get those forbearances when, when they say they need them. I, I think also you have to anticipate at least three and maybe five. And, and to your earlier point that SIGTARP is still bringing cases, maybe a decade of, of fallout from the decisions you're making today. And, and so that makes it much more important to have the right people around the table. You really, you really need to make sure that you're, you know, thinking for the long term and not just the short term answer. And then I think lastly, just test, 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 get data get reports, make sure that things are working the way you think they are. We've actually increased our testing during this process, not decreased it. It's real easy to say, hey, we've got so much going on. The last thing we need is more testing. That's the exact wrong answer because you're building this stuff. Like I mentioned earlier, we built a web tool so borrowers could self-serve with limited testing. So we got data on it and we test it every day just to make sure that you know, we didn't somehow make a mistake. So, so I think those are, are the, the primary things. And, and, and all, again, not a plug for, for any lawyer or, or specific firm, but you also need your lawyers with you to help you navigate this. So, so with that, I'll, I'll throw it back at you, Brock. You know, you, you said you've had inquiries from companies and on specific matters, but what, what do you tell them in terms of generally making their way through this just incredible situation we're all in? You know, I think the through line in all my advice is that companies need to be intentional, be thoughtful, and keep a good documented paper trail for everything they do. And most importantly, as an overarching consideration, regardless of the crisis situation, keep an eye on compliance. Even when compliance is confusing, you need to keep an eye on it. And compliance now, is, as we've touched on, is pretty confusing given the number of entities that are weighing in on, uh, on what companies have to do. So when I when I say be intentional and thoughtful, I mean give due consideration to all the factors that affect any decision you're going to make. And that mirrors what I do when, you know, when a client comes to me, or you ask me the question, what do I, what do I do when I get conflicting advice from state, state entities versus the CARES Act? Think it through, be thoughtful about it, and then, and then be intentional in what you are trying to do after having weighed 
all the various factors. You're exactly on the, on the keeping good documents piece. You're exactly right that decisions you make today may affect you 10 years from now or, you know, maybe two years from now when the government decides to bring a case or, or open an investigation. You want to make sure that all of your intentionality and all your thoughtfulness are well supported by documents. Uh, even if that means, I, I, I've never liked the phrase cover your ass, a CYA. <laughs> um, but w- what I do like is, is the idea that sometimes it's important to keep a record of why you've done things a certain way so that you can explain it later on and it doesn't look ridiculous. Right. So if, I mean, if it's you protection. have to make it a, it's protection. Yeah. It's, um, it's insurance, if yeah. you will. It, it also ensures that you're following a methodical thought process because when you commit something to writing, you, you realize pretty quickly if there's no logical underpinning to a decision you're making. If you're working something through and it's just verbal, verbal communication isn't all entirely precise. Or if it's in your head, that's certainly not precise. You're not really, you're not really dealing with other people and making it crisp. Uh, but when you commit it to writing, you can really get a sense for whether or not it makes sense. And when you've thought about that or when you can see it, I'm not saying you have to write a memo for everything you do. I'm just saying there, there needs to be something that reflects what you did and why you did it. You know, it, could, it needs to be encompassed somewhere. You know, I've, sort of, I've heard of decision matrices, matrices and things that record. Uh, I'm sure your tests are somehow, re- your test results are somehow recorded. Oh, absolutely. Some, something needs to be able to explain why well, you made a decision at a certain point. And it's, it's not just protection, but it's also about analytical rigor. Are you really thinking mm-hmm. through what you've done? And then the compliance piece, companies, I generalize here, but companies tend to get weak on compliance when they get busy, scared, concerned about profits, or, or just otherwise find a reason to cut corners. And this is a, this is a particularly bad time to get lazy on compliance because we will get through the pandemic. And after we are through the crisis situation, regulators, enforcers, prosecutors are going to start thinking about ways to, to investigate perceived misconduct. And they're going to be whistleblowers. They're going to be whistleblowers in your companies that may be incentivized to bring bring forth allegations for all all the worst reasons for self-gain. And so being compliant now, thinking everything through, keeping good records is going to go a long way towards preventing potential problems down the line. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, a lot of regulatory entities and, and in particular CFPB, which I was pleased to see, but, th- but they've talked about, you know, regulatory or examination leniency which is a terrific concept, except for what does it mean? And in particular, what does it mean three to five years from now when, when the state has a different administration and a new head of you know their financial services regulator? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a crapshoot for quite some time to come, depending on not only what state or what regulator, but what examination team you get. And so it, it, uh, to your point, you know, keeping good records of, of why you did today, what you did today, and then, and then not not taking your eye off the ball of, of continuing to just do things in a disciplined fashion across the board. I mean, I, I think that's great advice. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod, copyright 2020 by Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.